What's up friends, Jill here. Welcome back to Whispering Willow Farm. Today, Sean is out here helping me get some work done. We had some flower things we needed to do, um, but we're having some radish issues that we need to tend to quickly. And we kind of wanted to talk to you guys about that. So Sean was out here the other day and was walking through the garden. I think he was like harvesting something for to take home uh, for his wife to use for dinner. And he noticed that we were having lots of issues with the radishes and I kind of want you to talk about that and I'm going to try to pan so you guys can see it a little bit better but it's intense. It's intense and really like what made me notice it first was smelling it. Yes. I smelled that there was like kind of a funky smell <laughs> which is normally what radishes do when they get really stressed um, or like any kind of brassica is you get that funky brassica broccoli smell. Yeah. And so I came over here and noticed like the the leaves were droopy and then right away saw that it was aphids. Yeah bad like not like this fierce. is an aphid infestation yeah. happening so why why is this such a large problem because I've dealt with aphids before on like tomato plants but I've, I've literally never seen anything like what I'm about to show you guys so what happened here what caused this infestation to happen yeah I think part of it like I like I so when at the farm I used to manage we grew 6,000 pounds of daikons a year which is what I'm growing these are daikon radishes from Johnny's purple daikons um, so the daikon was uh, you know, cultivated in Asia it's a big staple crop you know it's it produces a lot of calories in a real small amount of area and and so I've had this problems like this before too yeah and I think part of it is just that the daikons are so vigorous they mm. grow so quickly and yeah. get so big and they're so juicy that it's just like a smorgasbord for aphids. <laughs> um, and so like the thing that I found with, with the daikons is I had to grow, start growing them like further and further apart oh. and more and more row in the, in, in the spacing and yeah. just having that airflow like fix the problem. Okay. So it might just be an airflow issue because it's so different like with the, like with the breakfast radishes or something, mm -hmm. like you can put them in there. They're only in yeah. there for 21 days. Right. So you put a bunch in and they all come out at the same time. You don't really have those issues, but these are in here for like, you remember how days of maturity? I think it's like 60 to 80 Maybe, depending yeah. on the size. Um, and so they're in there for a long time. They're just super vigorous. So all that new, young, fleshy growth, like the aphids just love it. And yeah. so the space really helps. And that also will reduce like any like root rot kind of stuff. Right. And so, but if we do not get this out now and fix this infestation problem, my carrots are planted right, uh, next, right to, yeah. next to this. And so like Sean was mentioning, if we don't, address this now it's going to move on to the carrots which are going to move to the brassicas which are going to move to a lot of other things so when you see something like this if you're dealing with it if it's just one plant rip it up um, but if it's your whole like section that you're doing definitely get rid of that and we're going to show you guys the proper and right way to do that i'm gonna take the camera off and show them a close-up though because this okay. is insane like aphids can reproduce asexually they can just like make copies of themselves so an infestation can get out of hand super quick. Like it's not like other insects that have like a mating period and then they like, um, you know, will pupate in the soil and then hatch out at the same time every year. Like aphids just go and they can produce sexually or asexually, like literally just make copies of themselves. And so that's why the aphid infestations can get so bad so quickly. Yeah, I mean, it almost looks like we like dipped it in like sand or something, but all these little things are, are aphids. Um, you know, and to try and like spray this when it's already this bad is almost impossible because you can't get into all the areas. Um, they do respond respond well to like insecticidal soaps. And so that was one thing we're going to do for the roots, like just to make sure we kill the, the aphids on the roots, is we're going to dip the roots in uh, some like just some of her natural dish, dish soap mixed with water. And then that soap will help like cover their, the outside of their bodies are exoskeletons and they basically suffocate in that soap. Um, but for the leaves, like, uh, like the root crop program that I started at the old farm, like I liked to just sell the roots and leave the foliage in the field to, to keep the soil covered. So like we'd chop and drop the foliage as we harvested the roots. Um, I really like that technique, but in a situation like this, if you did that, like Jill said, they'll just move on to the carrots. And when they're finished with the carrots, we got all these uh, overwintered cut flowers, they'll move on to the cut flowers. And that cannot happen. <laughs> <laughs> so we are going to get rid of all this foliage and you know we could dunk all the foliage in soapy water but there's a lot of it so really like a burn pile is probably the best thing you can do to like just get all these aphids just like destroyed disposed of um, otherwise they're just gonna move to other parts of the garden like even if you know your compost pile is kind of close to the garden 
and the cut flowers are next to the compost pile. So even if we put them over there, they would just kind of move into the, the flowers. So we just got to dispose of all this foliage. Yeah, so we have brought the wheelbarrow in here and that is where we are chopping off all the leaves and then yeah, we're gonna take it to the back part of the property and burn it um, just to be safe. And that is something, even if you have any sort of disease plant, no matter what season you're growing in, we really recommend you do not put that into your compost because it's gonna leach and just spread that. It's really best just to burn those as well. So let's get a game plan before we like get into this. Yeah, sure. All right, so uh, what I've kind of fun found helpful is like having one person pull and then one person chopping. Okay, sure. And especially since we want to keep all the aphids contained, right. like let's do all the chopping over the wheelbarrow so that we can uh, okay. keep them contained. So would you like me to harvest and hand them to you? Yeah, yeah I want you to do that your... and then I'll, I'll chop. Okay. Um, yep. And just, just throw them in there. Perfect. And then I'm, I'll do one up close too so they can see. Yeah just where the best part to cut is. Meanwhile though, they look really good. Yeah, they're huge. They I are mean, huge. Daikons are, they're probably one of my favorite wintered vegetables. And especially like as a market farmer, like selling them because they just store, they, they can store like up to nine months. Yeah. Just in a refrigerator. Which is really nice. And you would do in that case, what we are doing now too. Uh, you'd still chop the leaves off, the foliage off the top. Yeah. And then just throw them in the fridge. Yep. Yeah, and, and in a plastic bag with, with holes in it. So yeah. it's high humidity, but it's not 100% humidity. And they'll last for nine months. You don't need to can them. You don't need to freeze them. You don't need to, like, that's what's so great about root crops. is like, they don't take all that processing. But like, if you were gonna do the same thing with green beans. Right. Check that out though. These are huge. So when harvesting the daikons, I mean, that is a beautiful radish. And they're really sweet too. If you've never had a daikon, they come in all different colors. Um, I find that like as a, a market farmer, I'd like to mix the colors and then put them in one bag and people really like that because when you would make a stir fry or something with it, you have all this color in it and you're trying to eat the rainbow. Um, so the, you know, usually they're really long too, which makes it helpful for, for chopping and making like long uh, sticks with them too. So whether you're stir frying them or you're just eating them raw, like they're really sweet. Um, they don't have a real hot, uh, taste like some of the breakfast radishes and stuff might get especially if, if they were grown in the spring or the summer so just really great all around eating radish and so what I do to, for this for storing them is I cut the top off like right where it connects to that base and then I also cut the tail off so I, I top and tail them uh, you know if you don't cut the tail off that's okay but once you're storing it and you're storing it for a really long time uh, that tail is usually the first place it's gonna start to rot either there or if you like cut kind of deep into the radish that might start to get rotting but we've we've stored these radishes for like four months and the the top was starting to look a little soft and we just put a, a fresh cut on it and then it was good to sell again um just because they store for so long but I'm, I'm gonna cut into this jill okay we can we'll all eat it for lunch or something but yeah. the color on that Wow, that is beautiful. Isn't that cool? Yeah. Yeah, so the, the daikons are just such an eatable radish. Like, I just I even love them raw. So these are good. Because <laughs> there's no irrigation in this bed. That's amazing. Yeah, so this bed has just been... I mean, I watered them really good to mm -hmm. like get them to germinate and stuff. But other than that, this bed has just been watered by the rainwater. And so, usually I find when it gets really hot, they get that really spicy woody thing. Yeah, and these, these don't have that. Yeah, they don't even look woody, which is one thing I do love about the daikon. Even though they get large, which they're supposed to, they just don't have that yeah. really woody texture. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how do you, what, what's your like, you wouldn't eat that raw, would you? Uh, if I like had some like hummus, hummus yeah. Okay. I mean, I'm not about to just like you did, chop it open and start munching. It's really good with the, the dirt and, the, <laughs> and all, the, all the aphid blood on it. <laughs> I prefer to take them inside, wash them, dip them in some hummus, but <laughs> <laughs> we are growing these. This was something that our families did together. We partnered on this mm -hmm. um, because his wife, Melanie, does ferments. all Ooh. the ferments on a very large scale. Mm -hmm. He's really, really good at it. And so Nathan is obsessed with ferments as well. And so we kind of agreed we would grow a bunch of things in here that we could ferment together. So that was kind of the purpose behind this. 
fermenting food is really, really easy. It's a yeah. good way to store your things and it's super healthy for you. So that is why we decided to grow these so we could experiment together. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. There's rain. They're getting rained on, y'all. All right, so I moved under the pavilion because the heavens fell down for a minute and I'm sure I'm still back there chopping away. But I mentioned to you guys often, grow radishes because they're so easy to grow. They're super versatile, they store long, they're quick turnaround crop, especially if you're not growing a larger variety like the daikon. There's just a lot of things you can do with them. The thought of having vegetables in like 21 days that will store for months at a time with little investment into it is really appealing. And then if you are into ferments or you're wanting to dabble into ferments, fermenting something like a radish or a kohlrabi is a lot easier than doing something like sauerkraut. It's just not as involved. Um, and so I really encourage you guys to do that. I am not going to be reseeding out here. So I ripped these up. I don't have enough time to grow the daikon radishes again, but I am going to be direct seeding some of the faster varieties like the breakfast radish. There's like a plum variety uh, from Baker Creek that I get that I really like that I could do um, out in the tunnel. All right, so this is all of them. Huh? How, how much do you think's there? Which they can't even see. I should lift this up. Oh. Yeah. That's kind of heavy. That thing's it's, full of radishes. So I would say there's probably like at least 20 pounds. Uh, I mean, this guy's like almost a pound, I bet, I know. just by himself. It's huge. Um, and then there's less than 30 square feet. So you're like near two thirds to a pound per square foot. That's good. In terms of like food yield, that's really good. Yeah, that's really good. Yeah. And you could, you know, I did have these planted kind of close, but you could grow a smaller variety and plant them closer and they would be fine. You direct seed them, so that's a step that you're not having to worry about starting them and then transplanting them out, which is really appealing to a lot of people as well. Yeah. So another reason that I really love having a high tunnel is because even though I can't grow these radishes again out here, I've missed that window, mm -hmm. I can be starting that window in the tunnel. And like most of my direct seeded things, I haven't even direct seeded in the tunnel yet spinach, yeah. arugula, some of my root vegetables. Mm -hmm. So that is a really large advantage of having a high tunnel is when you are kind of at the mercy of the seasons and you can't grow certain things outdoors anymore, you are able to just kind of shift gears and still grow a lot of things inside your tunnel all winter, mm -hmm. which is a huge advantage. Yeah. Like the, we planted flowers in there and they're looking really good. Yeah, they are. And then once those brassicas come out that are in there now, you'll get to do spinach all through the winter. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. At least in Arkansas, with the tunnel, you can plant lettuce every single week of the year, like transplants, every single week of the year. Isn't that crazy? So how often do you need to be starting those to be transplanting those out? Uh, I'm trying to think of what my, it's like been a while now. I'm like out of it. I'm gotten into the flower game. Like, <laughs> out of, out of the, we didn't hop on that train. Uh, I think it was like three to four weeks yeah, or something like I that. I want to say it was three yeah. weeks we were starting. Yeah. You were telling me to start and transplant out. So. Yeah. Regardless, there will be something growing in that tunnel year round, mm -hmm. which is major benefit. Yeah, and it also depends where you're at too. So yeah. like Arkansas, we only have like a week where we get less than 10 hours of daylight. Yeah. And that's the, like this optimal number for plants. They go into this thing, uh, Elliot Coleman calls it Persephone period, oh. like where the sun goes away and plants stop growing. Okay. So once you drip, dip below that 10 hours of daylight, yeah. plants stop. Mm. Um, so like north of Arkansas, they use their tunnels instead of like starting stuff in the winter. It's almost like a giant refrigerator. Oh. Like they can start their kale and then it's in the tunnel and it's just going to keep living through the harsh Minnesota winter and can be harvested all winter, wow. but it's not going to keep necessarily growing all yeah. winter. But Arkansas and South, yeah. we can keep growing. Yeah, that's awesome. Cool. Move to Arkansas. <laughs> So, <laughs> so now that Sean has topped all of them off, we have all that in the wheelbarrow, which we're going to take to the back of the property and burn. Probably not right now since it's a little windy and stormy. Uh, we're going to take these in the house and just dunk these in that soapy water. Any soap that you use is fine. It's pretty much just to add, it's just to wash them off. Yeah, you just don't want to put them in the cooler with the aphids on them. Yeah. They'll just keep feasting all yeah. winter long. And then once we do that, they're literally just gonna go in our extra refrigerator. We'll probably keep them in this tote and just pull from them when we get ready mm -hmm. to ferment them all. So yeah. if you are having a infestation issue like that, that is how you can treat it. So one thing Sean said that I couldn't agree with more is you'll hear us talking a lot about 
like there's no need to kind of transfer a lot of that stuff to your compost when you could just leave it and it's like just on the bed to decompose which we really do recommend if you're having any sort of issue like that do not do that i mean i really agree with you on that can cause a lot of damage and they're just going to move and find something else to feed off of so make sure you're taking those far away and disposing of them properly so that it's not causing more issues for you later on down the road so even like on the prevention side you know, that's taking you extra labor, right? You could have just chopped the leaves off and left them where they are. Maybe yeah. keep the soil protected and, and feed it. And you're mm -hmm. not removing ex excess fertility. Yeah. But now we have the extra labor of like chopping off and taking it to the back of the property. So like doing the spacing yeah. like, on the front end mm -hmm. and like some of the pest management stuff and prevention on the front end saves you the labor on the back end. Yeah. And so it's like all, all everything in farming just goes back to right. like planning and being like realizing like where your labor is going to affect you down the road right. by making certain choices so. absolutely but like that yeah that was the first time you've grown daikons in this bed right right and so and yep. you groom through the the summertime yep and so it's just all it's all learning experience mm -hmm. so now we can you can bump the a little bit more spacing into the yeah into the road. which is what i'll do you guys know i keep pretty detailed notes and whether that's in a journal or on my phone and i'll just type in literally daikon radish beside it needs more spacing aphid mm -hmm. infestation aphid yeah. infestation that way i know when i'm going back through my notes over the year which is usually what i do i've taken all these mm -hmm. jumbled my brain onto paper or in my phone and i'm trying to piece it all together for notes for next year on if I want to plant a variety or I don't want to plant that variety this will be one of those things I know so take those notes it is valuable to have mm -hmm. some sort of planner or a notebook or even if it's just an excel sheet you yeah. know on your computer whatever you can do you need to know that because more than likely you'll forget mm -hmm. especially if you're growing a lot of different things on a large scale and it's good just to have that as a reference yeah and then even like back to talking about our location like with the tunnel yeah like following the back of the seed packet isn't always right. the best recommended right. guy. We ran into that with the flowers. Yeah. It's like, if someone's in Washington, their spacing is gonna be different than if they're in Arkansas or Florida. Mm -hmm. And so the packet's not always the gospel in that regard. Yeah. Like, it's an overview for a lot of different regions, regions and climates. Yeah. And that's really hard because we're all so different. Yep. All right guys, we are about to take this inside and clean them and store them, but I wanted to take you guys along with us as we were dealing and treating <laughs> the problem we were having. Troubleshooting. Yeah, troubleshooting some of the radish things, but thank you guys so much for hanging out. We'll talk to you soon.